so wonderful to see so many familiar faces, uh, new faces as well joining us. Uh, and, and as our theme of this conference uh, introduces, these are your dollars. This is your budget. Uh, and these priorities should reflect the needs of all 11 million Georgians across our state. So this morning, I'm going to walk you through the governor's executive budget, recent fiscal trends, uh, and, and make the case of why our state is in position uh, to do so much more. Wonderful. So just, just to get started with a little bit of a primer uh, of, of what we're talking about today, uh, in Georgia, the budget process starts with the governor's executive budget. And our fiscal year runs between July 1st and June 30th. So every year, uh, in the, the second week of January, as the General Assembly convenes, the governor will introduce the amended budget for the current fiscal year. Uh, in this case, we're talking about 2024 uh, and the full budget for the next fiscal year that will begin on July 1st uh, of, of 2024. Uh, and in Georgia, the key authority held by the governor is the ability to set the revenue estimate. That's the number that caps the amount that can be appropriated by the General Assembly. Uh, and, and, and that's extremely important because what we've seen in recent years uh, are revenue estimates that have uh, been far below the amount that our state has actually collected. So between 2021 and 2023, uh, the state ran a surplus between 15 and 23 percent of the amount that the General Assembly appropriated. That is completely unprecedented in our state's history. And the result is that today we have more than $16 billion available to our state in reserves. About $11 billion of that is off the books. It's called undesignated reserves, uh, meaning that the state has no plan to use these funds. And they could be deployed immediately to cover the, the whole host of needs uh, that you'll hear about this morning. Uh, and so, what we see in the current budget is a little bit of progress in that it marks the first year that our state is on track, uh, as proposed by the governor, to spend more per person than we did prior to the pandemic. So you can see uh, in, in this chart uh, that when we adjust the, the, the 2020 rate of spending, uh, which is the budget that was enacted just before the pandemic hit, uh, to, to inflation, uh, the state is on track to spend about $210 per person more in 2025, the upcoming fiscal year, than we did in the last fiscal year. Um, you know, that, that, that's progress, uh, certainly, but when we zoom out a little bit, that marks a, a real growth rate of only 1.5% per year. So we're really holding in place. Uh, and, and, and so while, while we see progress here, uh, undeniably, our state can continue to do more. Now, just, just to walk through a few highlights from uh, the, the proposed budget, and, 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 and I'll cover uh, some of the top lines that we see in both the amended fiscal year, uh, which is really designed to adjust for enrollment, uh, to, to adjust for revenue collections, um, and, and to make really kind of targeted investments, and then the full fiscal year where we see those recurring funds added. Um, so again, uh, we see a big jump from the last fiscal year where uh, the, the, the revenue estimate was really held extremely low. Uh, prior to this amended budget, we were on track to run a surplus uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of $5 billion. Uh, and, and so we see considerable resources added, um, but they are still below the state's capacity. So our amended year budget uh, is a jump of about 15% from the original budget that we're operating under right now. Uh, the full budget for next year, a jump of about 11%, uh, but still a revenue estimate that's on track uh, to uh, come in lower than what we anticipate, uh, which would mean another large surplus for the state, adding to those reserves rather than spending them down. Uh, so these additions are primarily focused across education and healthcare. Uh, Pre-K through 12th grade education is where we see the lion's share of additions, uh, about $1.5 billion. We see a little over $650 million uh, added for health agencies. Most of those funds are just to keep things going uh, the way that they are right now uh, when it comes to those health care programs. They're to adjust for changes in Medicaid as federal funding tapers off 
from the pandemic era. Uh, they're to make needed pay, raise for, pay raises for uh, employees of the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities. Uh, folks that, that have, you know, functions that have been outsourced to uh, third parties because pay is so low that the state uh, is unable to attract sufficient workers, uh, providers. Um, and so really, we're just kind of catching up um, to meet existing demand, existing needs. Uh, but these investments are long overdue. Uh, and, and they're you know, kind of fundamentally um, closing holes, but not necessarily making uh, big leaps forward. When it comes to the current fiscal year, even with these additions that we see, even with that $5 billion added, uh, the governor's revenue estimate still shows a sharp decline uh, in what the state's projecting to collect. And, and what that adds up to, given the trend that we see right now, is that the state is on track to run yet another surplus. Um, so the governor's projecting that that revenue estimate, uh, overall the tax collections are going to decline by about 7.5%. Um, that, that, that's a significant decline that so far is just not borne out in the data uh, that we see. Um, again, next year, the governor's projecting uh, another de a decline of 6% below what we collected last year. Uh, you know, the, the, the state economist spoke earlier this week, uh, said that he incorporated kind of uh, the likelihood of a mild recession in that, uh, the, the results of inflation tapering off, uh, but still uh, those numbers are uh, below the baseline, below what's reflected in the data. Um, and, and, and mean that we are spending less than our capacity as a state that we could do significantly more. Um, a, a few other highlights that we see in these budgets, uh, again, kind of long overdue investments. We see a little over $200 million added uh, to, to increase the formula for student transportation for K through 12 schools. This has been a really glaring deficiency in recent years uh, and something that our K through 12 analyst, uh, Stephen Owens, our educational analyst, has really uh, highlighted and brought to bear uh, to the forefront of the discussion. Uh, because what it means when the state has reduced funding from over 50% that, that the state used to cover in the 1990s to last year only 17% of more than a billion dollars in transportation expenses across the state. Those are funds that get over a million kids to school every day, uh, you know, kind of the definition of fundamentally necessary expenditures. When the state cut back those funds, local school districts had to fill that hole. They had to do that in a myriad of ways, uh, increasing class sizes, reducing uh, after-school programs, making cuts wherever they could to try to make up for those funds that were uh, reduced by the state. So we, we got down to 17% uh, of actual transportation costs in 2023. Uh, the governor's added $200 million to that formula next year. Uh, that should cover about 31% of costs. So still, school districts are having to carry the lion's share of that burden, uh, and, and the state needs to do more, uh, particularly when it comes to school bus replacement. Uh, and, and, and I'll uh, show a little bit of, of kind of how that need is reflected uh, as we go forward. Uh, I also want to highlight about $105 million the governor's added to the education formula uh, under the banner of school security. Uh, however, those funds are going to be largely flexible. Districts are going to be able to use those uh, likely to close some of those gaps that have been created as the state has reduced funding. Uh, we also see about $484 million for Medicaid and Peach Care. Most of those funds, again, are just going to make up for federal funds that are being lost as we transition out of increased federal funding to keep things constant. Uh, and, and if we want to bring an infusion into the state's health care system, the best thing that we can do is to fully expand Medicaid, bring billions of dollars into the state every year, uh, and actually save money uh, from the course that we've chosen uh, under the Pathways program. Uh, and, and, and so we're hopeful that that will be uh, a, a, an infusion that the state will accept, uh, which will result in more Medicaid funding across the board and up to half a million Georgians uh, getting the health care that they so badly need. Uh, we also see about $80 million to the Department of Behavioral Health. Uh, that money is going uh, to, to increase provider rates. Uh, we have a waiting list of more than 7,000 folks across the state uh, who, who are waiting for those services. Uh, this will uh, close that gap a little bit, but still leave a huge unmet need. So to, to walk through uh, what kind of the, the core functions the state focuses on, uh, when we look at the 2025 budget, over half uh, it goes to public education. 
about 53% between uh, pre-K through 12th grade uh, and, and higher education. Uh, about 21% of all state spending of that $36 billion budget is going to health care, uh, primarily Medicaid. Uh, and of course, our state is going through uh, a huge Medicaid unwinding process. Right now, that's resulted in hundreds of thousands of Georgians losing their coverage. Uh, again, this is a, a, a really urgent area of need, uh, a, a, as we heard uh, in, in, in Dr. Dawes' uh, presentation. And, and, and certainly, the minimum that our state can do is to expand Medicaid to join those 40 other states. Uh, and and then to get to work on really addressing those underlying issues and, and closing the gap facing so many families across our state. Uh, then you'll see transportation, uh, the next largest category. Uh, all of the funds that the state collects from the gas tax go directly to fund transportation and infrastructure. Uh, so when the state suspends its gas tax, as we did for uh, a few months earlier this year, that means we've got to draw funds from other revenue sources to make up for, their, for that gap. And that's what we've seen in the current year and in the last year. But because we've spent so far below our capacity, uh, the, you know, those funds have been fairly easy to find. Uh, then, then we get to our criminal legal system. Uh, as my colleague Ray uh, will, Califani will discuss, uh, really this is an area, a, a huge black eye for the state, uh, where our criminal legal system has left so many Georgians behind, uh, really deplorable conditions uh, across those facilities, um, and, and, and little done um, to, to truly close that gap in this year. Um, and then you can see, when it comes to all other government agencies, uh, those only comprise about 4% of state spending. So still a really lean, conservative government, um, you know, where primarily the focus is on health care, public education, uh, and, and, and significant holes remain. So the, the really unusual thing that the governor has proposed doing in this budget and where a large portion of the new funds that are being added in the amended budget and in next year's budget are going are to pay for infrastructure projects in cash. So historically, the way that the state pays for capital projects is through bonding. You can see on this chart sort of the, the, the last uh, 10 uh, 12 years or so of the state's bond capacity. So under our constitution, the state can borrow uh, up to 10% of its revenue digest every year to use for bonds. Um, that's important because one of kind of our prized assets is our AAA credit rating. We've held that rating for over 25 years. I'll add that we've had it even in times where we've dipped into reserves. Uh, so that that you know that that argument um, that that we need to hold on to huge levels of funding that are completely outside of the norm of what we had what we've had at any point in our history uh, really doesn't hold water when we look at the history of that credit rating. Uh, but what it allows us to do is to borrow money at a low cost and to stretch those dollars further. When we do something like what the governor is proposing uh, in these budgets to spend about $2 billion in cash in, on infrastructure, that means that instead of using that bond capacity, uh, we're going to use those dollars to less effect. We're not going to be able to cover recurring expenses with that $2 billion. Rather, we're going to use it uh, on, 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 on these uh, cash projects instead of using the bond capacity. Uh, you know, that is, is even more unusual because in, in the last two years, we have borrowed at the lowest level uh, that we've seen in modern history. We're now at about 3.6% uh, in the current budget, 3.7% in next year's budget. Again, we can go up to 10%. The historical average over the last 10 years uh, is a little bit north of 5%. So we are borrowing at, a, at an unusually low level, um, and that means less money for recurring expenses uh, and that we're using uh, the cash that we are bringing in in recurring revenues on these one-time expenses, uh, getting less bang for our buck. Um, and, and it's just another Another area where you can see that there is room in this budget to expand. Um, if we shifted some of those expenditures to bonds instead of cash, that would free up hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, that could ben then be used for things like healthcare, education, uh, our, our criminal legal system, and so forth. Um, to improve uh, the government services that are available to Georgians. So uh, another uh, really unusual area where you see us losing, using uh, below our capacity. So I, I just want to uh, 
look at the, the revenue estimate for a moment, um, and, and, and I know you see a lot of numbers um, on this screen, but, but what this adds up to uh, for next year is a revenue estimate that, again, uh, is lower than what the state is likely to raise. Uh, so when we look at our major sources of revenue, the governor is projecting that sales taxes uh, will decrease our sales tax digest will decrease by about 6% year over year. Uh, personal income tax revenues to dip by about 7%. Corporate income tax revenues to go down about 20%. And no money uh, from the state's unobligated reserves, undesignated reserves. None of that $11 billion is incorporated in this revenue estimate. So again, we see a, a, a continued pattern of putting the revenue estimate lower than what the state is likely to raise, which means artificially holding down our level of spending and continuing to pad those reserves uh, with no end in sight. So uh, th this just shows you the year-over-year -year trend of revenues, uh, both reported uh, and estimated for next year. So you can see uh, through the pandemic era, the state saw really significant growth. Uh, that was kind of across all of our major sources of revenue. Uh, you can see our, our, our personal income tax here uh, lifted partly through inflation, partly through wage increases, partly through increased employment. You see sales taxes uh, increasing significantly. Uh, that is another consequence of inflation, but also heightened consumer spending, uh, more money in folks' pockets as the federal government stepped up to help us avoid a major recession, uh, and, and a similar phenomenon going on in the corporate income tax, although there, that is partially a structural change. So uh, that money is, it, it, as uh, folks have shifted from uh, filing their taxes as, as individuals to corporate returns, money has been moved from essentially the personal income tax to the corporate income tax. So we have confidence that those numbers uh, are likely to hold up and that we have a higher baseline. But what that adds up to is this is where uh, the surplus uh, has really been, been coming from. Again, we've seen about $16 billion in unspent money over those three years uh, added um, and, and, and really just sitting in reserves at this point. Um, so when we look, look at the next two years, um, again, we see really conservative revenue estimates for the governor. So uh, estimating that, that all of these revenue sources um, are going to dip across the board, two per, uh, about 3% uh, down year over year. That includes, uh, by the way, uh, $2 billion that the governor says will be available from uh, the, the un unobligated surplus, but which we find that the state is unlikely to actually spend because that revenue estimate remains so low. Um, and, and again, when we look at 2025, despite that increase, we're still projecting that, that baseline revenues are going to go down even further from that, that low level that we have for the current year, um, which again, points to another surplus or continued resources that are available uh, for the state to use. So th this is just a chart, a chart that shows you how unprecedented this trend is. Uh, prior to the, the last three years, the, the largest amount that the state held in reserves was about 11% of state revenues. Today, we're north of 45%. That's just an unbelievable trend, um, again, that has no precedent in our state's history and that just makes clear that those funds are available and are ready to be used. Uh, and, 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 and we still haven't seen a plan uh, put forward by our state leaders to do that. So you can see uh, just how, how that increase um, you know, ha has uh, compounded over recent years, uh, the, the precedent of the last 10 years. And I'll just add to this that under state law, our revenue shortfall reserve, which is the state savings account that, that's intended to be used in times of recession uh, to help our state avoid uh, sharp spending cuts or tax increases uh, when revenues do go down in the event of a recession as unemployment goes up and folks have less money available to spend. But that's capped at 15% under state law, uh, and, and that actually uh, is a higher level than we've seen historically in previous recessions. It was raised after the last recession from 10% to 15%, um, and, and so uh, we, we don't have any recognition of the unobligated surplus because of that, because state law only anticipates that we would go up to 15%. So uh, those reserves that we continue to add on to are actually not even recognized under state law, um, and, and that's a real problem. 
Um, and, and again, just shows how unusual this environment is uh, and how, at this point, we're really operating outside of the framework that Georgia's budget process was designed for. Um, and, and that's why uh, you know, the, it, it demands a, a, a real action and a real effort um, and certainly will be uh, one of the primary areas of advocacy uh, that we'll be uh, pushing for during this session. Um, so, you know, the, the surplus funds that I've been talking about actually are only general fund revenues. So when we look at the lottery, we see a similar trend. Right now, the state is sitting on about $2.2 billion in lottery reserves alone. And lottery revenues are reserved for pre-K education and higher education. So that's what those funds have to be used for. Um, but again, we see a similar trend where last year the state added about 12 percent uh, of, of revenues to the, the lottery reserve um, and, and to this point does not have a plan to spend down those reserves. So you'll hear from my colleague Ashley Young um, that there are a lot of great ways that we could use those funds, a lot of unmet need right now. Um, and actually earlier this week we saw a proposal from House Leadership Speaker Burns uh, and Pro Tem Jan Jones who proposed a plan to use about $100 million uh, to strengthen the state's pre-K program. But still uh, we have plentiful resources available, um, a lot of unmet need, but not yet consensus from state leaders uh, on how to use those funds. But you can just see here, we're growing continually um, at really an unprecedented pace. Um, and, and that's why, again, as we look at the next uh, two years of revenue estimates, we can have confidence that the state um, is, is on track to um, continue to add to these reserves rather than subtract from them. So just to zero in on the issue of student transportation because um, of how important it is to districts across our state, uh, the consequences of the state reducing funding for this vital area over the last three, uh, three decades has led to huge unmet need. You know, districts have only been able to stretch their dollars so far to close the gap that's been created by the state. So what that means is that today on Georgia's roads, about one third of all school buses are 15 years or older. That's 6,300 buses that need to be replaced. Um, we have about 20,000 buses in total on the roads. Um, if we were to replace all of those buses, um, that's about a $2.7 billion investment. If we were to replace just those that are 15 years or older, uh, that's about an, an $850 million investment. Um, so again, those resources are available. This is a perfect use of uh, surplus dollars, um, kind of the definition of one-time funding that will save districts in recurring expenses. Um, and, and they're having to redirect resources right now that could be going to uh, increase student outcomes, to support students living in poverty, to do a whole host of things that are, that are going unmet right now because they're having to redirect those dollars towards student transportation. Um, so uh, even though we see that, that formula increase, about $200 million in the governor's budget, again, that's only going to get us up to about 31% of costs that are paid by, uh, for student transportation that are paid by the state, uh, leaving districts to cover almost 70%. Um, all the while, they're, they're having this outdated school bus fleet. Uh, it costs more money in fuel. Uh, a lot of these buses are running on diesel uh, models that, that could be uh, upgraded and could lead to other recurring expenses. Um, and, and also uh, give districts more money to address the crisis that we see in bus drivers. And, and Stephen will talk a little bit more about um, how that's borne out um, and, and what that challenge means. But, we only see about $20 million in this budget to replace about 200 school buses. So again, I mean, I think that that is just obvious how, how much we're undershooting that need and just kicking this can down the road, which is going to need to be addressed uh, eventually. So when we talk about our $11 billion in unobligated surplus, uh, we have spent the last year looking around the state, talking to folks, listening to lawmakers and state leaders, hearing about sort of their parameters for how they think these funds should be used. Um, and the core area of investment that we've identified as a team is the need for the state to do more in childcare. Uh, right now, the state has a very limited program that's just for families with extremely low incomes uh, that matches federal funding uh, called CAPS. 
That program is, is really insufficient to cover the need that we see across the state and, and sort of does the bare minimum to draw down federal funding. Uh, what we recommend is that the state takes about $7.5 billion of those surplus funds. So that would be equivalent to less than the amount that we've uh, added to reserves over just the last two years. Um, you know, really uh, kind of a, a fraction of what we have available, uh, and put those funds in a dedicated child care trust fund that would become self-sustaining uh, by bearing interest over time uh, and being invested by the state in a similar way to what we do with our pension system uh, for teachers and state employees. So if we took that $7.5 billion and made really conservative assumptions uh, based off of the 30-year trajectory that we've seen, we estimate that in year one, the state could raise almost $500 million and sustain that over time in a way that adjusts for inflation as a dedicated source of revenue for childcare. Uh, this could be an expansive program uh, that increases both capacity in areas where we see just completely insufficient uh, options for families to meet the need that exists right now, uh, while also helping to subsidize those direct costs to make sure that child care is affordable uh, for every family in this state. Uh, to be sure, you know, this is really a down payment on that. Uh, more resources are going to be needed if we want to imagine a really universal program. But in year one, doing this approach, we could exceed the amount that the state right now is dedicating to pre-K. Uh, so it would be a really significant investment. Uh, it would be a way to turn one-time revenues into recurring revenues, uh, fits within those parameters that we've heard from the governor, from other state leaders, and would be a real investment in our future where we could continue to build on those funds uh, and address a source, uh, a, a core function of government that right now uh, we, we are not providing for. Um, Obviously, the economy has changed tremendously, workforce participation, families need access to child care, uh, and, and the state is simply uh, doing very little right now to meet that need. So uh, this is an area that we hope lawmakers will give consideration to. Uh, we propose this as a constitutional amendment to protect those funds, uh, to ensure that they can be obligated permanently, protected, and used. And, and I'll just add that a constitutional amendment is the one resource available to lawmakers to be able to tap into uh, those surplus funds. The governor has full authority right now under state law over releasing surplus funds as part of the revenue estimate. And that, again, caps the amount that lawmakers can appropriate. But if we were to do a constitutional amendment, that is in the full purview of the General Assembly. The governor actually doesn't even, doesn't have the power to veto a constitutional amendment and, and, and doesn't have to sign it. Um, and so that's a way that the General Assembly uh, could be empowered to take charge, to use these funds, um, and is completely within their authority uh, over appropriations and over uh, governing. So one, one of the uh, programs that we've heard from the governor, one of his policy priorities, uh, is to accelerate the flat tax that was passed in 2022. So in January of this year, the state moved from a graduated tax bracket uh, between 1 and 5.7 percent to a flat tax of 5.75 percent, or excuse me, to a flat tax of uh, 5.49 percent uh, and a standard deduction uh, that's a bit larger than what it was in the past. Uh, and so... The effects of that program basically uh, on the flat tax side have meant very little for most families. Uh, basically, a, a slight in tax increase uh, for a lot of folks and, and, and sort of holding most other people harmless outside of the highest income brackets, uh, while the standard deduction is really where most of those tax savings come from um, right now. Um, the governor has proposed accelerating that to a 5.39% flat tax uh, instead of the 5.49. Uh, so this is analysis that just shows where that money would go, uh, who would benefit. If we look at that middle income bracket, uh, the, 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 the middle income Georgians who earn an average of $58,000 a year, uh, each of these quintiles are about a million households. Uh, the average savings over a full year is $34. That's $3 a month, less than $3 a month. That, that's a change that's so small, most people aren't even going to notice it. If we get to the top 1% who's averaging almost $2 million a year, they would get an average savings just under $1,200. Uh, when you're earning that kind of money, still a, a tiny drop in the bucket. Most of those folks aren't going to notice that either. 
Um, that's coming at a cost of almost $350 million to the state per year. Uh, there are so many things that we could do that would make a greater impact in the lives of Georgians uh, rather than pursuing uh, this approach to cut from the top down, uh, to give most of these resources to those who are already at the very top of the economic ladder. Uh, we could expand Medicaid. We could enact an opportunity rate for student poverty. We could increase student transportation funding. We could do a whole host of things that you'll hear about uh, on the next panel. Um, but this is uh, almost certainly the lowest return way for most Georgians to spend this money. And so it's really important, you know, not to just kind of let this uh, pass, pass us by, uh, you know, to think it's only $350 million. Um, it, it, it's only a 0.1% a, a change to the income tax. It's significant and it adds up. And it means lost revenue uh, that the state is unlikely to get back that's going to be concentrated at the very top. So I'll just close uh, by, by continuing along the lines of revenue. Um, and, and one of the positive developments that we saw over the last year is that the state uh, lawmakers from both the House and the Senate traveled across the state as part of a joint review of the tax code. Um, unfortunately, we still haven't seen a report from that committee, um, which I think just points to the need for transparency and the need for these things to be built into statute so that it's not up to the political whims of our state leaders of whether to evaluate programs, how to evaluate them, and what kind of information to share with the people of our state. So right now, when we compare Georgia across the nation, we see that we have one of the least transparent tax systems in the country. And at the same time, we have a tax system uh, where lawmakers have invested our taxpayer resources very heavily in subsidizing corporations, uh, in creating really generous tax incentives that are designed uh, for specific industries uh, to, to try to uh, sort of um, push economic outcomes. But the problem is that right now, we have almost no disclosure very little reporting, um, and no standardized process across our tax code uh, for uh, these incentives to be evaluated and for information to be made available to the people of our state. So we have a series of recommendations to put Georgia from, you know, kind of last in the nation, uh, from the very bottom of states in terms of the information that we release, the way that we evaluate those systems, and to move us in line with the mainstream. Um, all of these things uh, are, are, are things that we see across the nation, things that have worked in other states, um, and, and kind of the least that we can do to bring accountability for those tax dollars um, and, and to share with uh, the people of our state where their money is going. So those are things like requiring uh, regular audits uh, of, of all the incentive programs, uh, not just allowing lawmakers to pick uh, what they want to do in any given year with no regularity, uh, requiring disclosure of where those uh, dollars are going and what the outcomes are, how many jobs are being created, what's the salary of those jobs. We don't know any of those things, um, and that's a real problem, and that means that we, we don't know what's working and what's not working. Um, also adding sunset dates. A lot of those larger incentives uh, are, are, are going to continue in perpetuity uh, because there's no expiration date. Uh, in terms of the film tax credit, uh, you know, which, which uh, is something that I know folks have a variety of opinions on, but one thing that I think that, that almost everyone can agree on is that we shouldn't be pushing our tax dollars out of state. Um, and so in our film tax credit, we have a provision that allows companies to write off the costs of out-of-state workers. We, we don't distinguish at all between those who live and work in Georgia and those who are contractors who are brought in. The companies can write off their salaries uh, just the same. That puts us in a really unusual group of states, um, and, and those dollars are almost completely uh, resulting in, in, in tax money being uh, pushed out of the state and in very little economic return. So that is sort of the minimum that we could do to tailor our film tax credit to the state. We also propose uh, putting in a cap so that we can make it a bit more predictable. Um, in, in the last year, the state estimated that about $1.4 billion in tax credits were issued. That makes the film tax credit far and away our largest incentive. Uh, it means that we're spending more on film tax credits than we are on human services. Services. 
Uh, it means that you know, the film tax credit, if it were a line item, would be about 4% of our budget, uh, which is equivalent to uh, all other state agencies, functions of government, outside of the core areas that we discussed. So this is a program that really has uh, been unchecked, and because we don't even put those baseline guardrails, uh, is, is resulting in huge quantities of money leaving our state uh, with very little effects. Um, so we could have a film tax credit that is still working, that prioritizes uh, Georgians, um, but that doesn't result in uh, all of the, that loss um, more broadly. Um, and, 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 and again, um, you know, what we've seen in state government more broadly, what we see today uh, is a turnover rate of 21% across the board. That means 21% of state employees each year are turning over or leaving their jobs. Uh, that's because we are clearly under-resourcing those positions. We're not paying folks enough. They're overworked. We don't have enough staff across core functions of government. If you try to get uh, a state agency on the phone uh, to, to get help with your SNAP processing or your Medicaid, good luck. Uh, we've heard that from so many Georgians across our state that it's, it's impossible to get the help that they need, and it's resulting in real detrimental outcomes, folks losing their health care, folks uh, facing unnecessary challenges for their families. Uh, we don't have to have that reality in Georgia. We have the resources, we have the funds available, and we can do more. Uh, so next we'll transition to a panel with our wonderful team where we'll talk about some of those solutions, some of those opportunities, uh, but I so much appreciate y'all being here uh, and thank you. Again, I'm Ife Finch Floyd, and I'm the Director of Economic Justice. Um, I'm going to start with the Department of Human Services. Um, and this agency um, serves millions of people and particularly focuses on adults adult and children who are vulnerable to abuse and neglect, and also on individuals and families um, who have very low income um, or live in poverty to, and um, helps provide some economic support to them. Next slide. So what we see in the governor's fiscal year 2025 uh, budget is about a billion dollars being sent to the Department of Human Services. Um, and this is about 25 million more than what we saw in FY uh, 2024, or about a 3% increase. And if we look at the budget that passed before um, the start of the pandemic, FY 2020, um, it's about a 22% increase or $181 million increase um, uh, since then. Next slide. So just breaking down first the governor's um, uh, amended fiscal year 2024 budget really quickly. Again, it's a, it's a billion dollars. Um, and a lot of um, the increase is for the $10 million for those uh, um, $1,000 bonuses that we saw the governor announce back in um, December. Also, $3.2 million um, for upgrades to the Shines case management system for child, the child welfare system and foster care system, and also $2.7 million to fund the Gwinnett Commercial um, Sexual Exploitation Recovery Center as well. Next slide. And breaking down the FY 2025 budget, again, a billion dollars. Um, a, a large share, 15.3 million, is going to the 4% COLA for state employees. There's another uh, $4.7 million um, and a, for an additional $3,000 pay boost for child welfare caseworkers. Additionally, um, another $4.7 million for that Gwinnett Center. Um, and then, uh, this is a, a small amount, but I wanted to um, lift it up here, $630,000 to fund 23 front desk staff for um, the Division of Family and Children's Services DFACs in the county offices. This has been an ongoing concern that DFACs offices have been closed in many counties or only open a few days a week. Um, and so um, the, the, the agency has been moving to solely reopen those counties to more days a week. Um, and hiring some of these um, front desk staff will allow those offices to be open. So the state um, 
is allowing for in more urban areas, metropolitan areas, five days a week openings. Um, in um, the smaller um, metropolitan areas, about four days a week. In rural areas, three days a week. Um, but I just want to highlight, these are just front desk staff. These aren't folks who are actually able to answer some of the tough questions people have about their applications um, or about their uh, eligibility um, for certain uh, programs. Um, these are uh, staff who can direct them to, to a kiosk um, and maybe help them kind of connect to any um, uh, phone numbers or maybe set up an appointment with a case manager. So I just wanted to highlight that, um, that it's still not where we need to be. You can see the breakdown of the numbers up here, um, but just kind of um, in sum, foster care and adoptions and child welfare make up more than 60% of the department's budget. Next slide. I'm gonna focus the rest of my remarks on human services, particularly around um, the workforce and specifically the workforce for DFACs and um, the eligibility um, workers. Um, because as I mentioned, there's a huge need for people who are applying for TANF, applying for SNAP, applying for Medicaid and other um, um, financial supports to be able to kind of talk to caseworkers to understand um, the, the application process, if they are already receiving benefits, you know, understand the status, and of course we know that Medicaid unwinding is going on and a lot of people have questions. We saw in FY 2024, there was $11 million in that budget to hire, and the state um, has been hiring to fill other uh, uh, vacancies of case managers. And what we heard from the commissioner yesterday um, was about, there's been about 1,000 people who have been hired as eligibility workers. Um, this, is, this is great. This is a great step forward. Um, we've seen turnover um, in DFACs decline. In, in 2022, their turnover was about 30%, um, but in 2023, because of this aggressive hiring um, and some increase in pay, um, uh, turnover declined to about 26%. So it's still a ways to go, um, but the, this is an improvement. This is a good thing. However, next slide. State leaders really need to have a balanced approach um, when we're talking about increasing pay for DFACS frontline workers. So DFACS, um, the DFACS office uh, or agency has two offices, the Office of Child Welfare and the Office of Family Independence. Um, and as I said earlier, uh, the child, uh, excuse me, the uh, caseworkers in the child welfare office, they are getting the 4% uh, cost of living adjustment um, that all state qualified employees are getting, but they're also getting that $3,000 pay increase, which is certainly needed um, to make sure that they can hire and retain the staff to do those challenging jobs. So an entry level worker um, who has a bachelor's degree, um, right now it's around $42,000 um, with these pay, um, supplements, pay increases, um, their pay would increase to about $47,000. We don't see this for their counterparts in the Office of Family Independence, DFACS eligibility workers. They're only going to get that 4% cost of living adjustment. So an entry level worker who does not necessarily have to have a bachelor's degree, um, they have, uh, they're at about $34,000 right now, entry level, um, and that 4% increase will um, boost their pay to about $35,000. So they're still going to be among the lowest paid um, workers in the state. And this is really critical because of uh, what Danny has mentioned already, what I've named, that there are huge, huge challenges of people trying to access and maintain their benefits. Um, the state really needs to focus on to continue hiring, but not just hiring, retaining those workers. What we've heard consistently is even when people are trained and ready to go, um, the work can be so challenging and so overwhelming that after a few months, a lot of people still leave. That has been the historical precedent. So the state really needs to focus on finding ways to make sure that they're keeping work, uh, um, uh, workload low and increasing the compensation. 
Georgia is ranked among the worst in the nation for kicking children off of Medicaid. That's a huge challenge that um, uh, the state needs to consider, and, and Leah will talk a little bit more about some of those solutions, but again, hiring is a part of it. Um, the state continues to have a backlog of delayed SNAP payments for thousands of households. That's been an issue for much of last year and is continuing. Customer service um, for prospective and current clients is abysmal, it's really, really poor. And if we're thinking about uh, trying to keep uh, children um, and families out of um, the, the, um, the site of Child Protective Services and the child welfare system, we need to make sure that they have those resources that they need to pay, uh, to keep a roof over their heads and put food on the table. So building a robust and experienced workforce is a part of that and boosting pay is a critical component to, to building that workforce. And I'll pass it off to my colleague, Ray Calfani. Thank you, Ife. Once again, uh, my name is Ray Calfani. I'm our senior analyst handling our workers' justice and criminal legal system portfolio. Um, and today I'll be talking about the, the, the budget proposals and the implications for the Georgia Department of Labor as well as the Georgia Department of Corrections. So, you know, to, to start to talk about, you know, just the Department of Labor. The Department of Labor is tasked with um, collecting employer contributions that supply uh, unemployment insurance benefits that go to people who lose jobs and no fault of their own. To be able to support them, you know, to be able to take care of their families, to be able to continue spending on, on goods and services that, that, continue, that, that keep the economy stabilized. Um, and just from a, from a workforce standpoint, allow them to be able to, to seek and train for, for suitable new jobs. Uh, so now, you know, going into just the numbers as far as your overall numbers for, you know, a minute fiscal year for the Department of Labor for a minute fiscal year 2024, um, you know, th there's going to be, you know, an increase. You know, the, governor, the governor proposes an increase of about $800,000. Um, to go to the Department of Labor um, just for, for bonuses, you know, for fiscal year 2024. And then going into fiscal year 2025, you know, proposes you know, a much smaller amount um, in new spending of, of about $400,000 um, to go to, you know, improving customer service, improving um, you know, the issues that the Department of Labor has had when it comes to UI claims uh, backlogs. So I'll, I'll go to the next slide with that and go a little bit deeper in, in, into amended fiscal year 2024 for the Department of Labor. So there, there's two major things that are taking place. Um, one is what I mentioned before, as far as you know, the $800,000 that will go to bonuses for eligible, eligible Department of Labor staff, but then you know, they're gonna be, there's $1.9 million that's being shifted out of the amended fiscal year 2024 budget to, to the next fiscal year 2025. So keep that number in mind, 1.9 million, right? And just before I go into anything further, just a couple of facts as far as, um, you know, just, you know, d data points on, like, workforce facts while I talk about budget numbers. Um, when you think about, you know, the, the, no the level of staff that the Department of Labor has right now, just for, for 2023, um, you know, in, 20 in fiscal year 2022, you know, 91% of those who were in 2022, 2023, 2023 were there in fiscal year 2022, and about 76% of those um, were there back in 2021. So basically that means, you know, with the current staff that Department of Labor has, about 25% of them are fairly new. And that means a lot when you think about, um, you know, institutional knowledge that goes into the type of work that they do. So, you know, and going to the, the, the next slide, when you think about, um, you know, fiscal year 2025, it's very, very, um, the, the, the changes, the increases when you think about budget proposals that the governor has given for fiscal year 2025 are relatively small. You know, about 35,000 will go to um, cost of living increases for staff. And then another, I want to say, I believe it's 459,000 that's going to go to um, address the issues when it comes to, again, customer service issues and UI backlog issues. Now, come back to that number I gave before, 1.9 million. That was shifted out of their 2024 budget to also go into their 2025 budget to address those customer service issues and UI backlog issues. So, you know, from there, I'll, I'll go to the next slide and um, think about, like, what did this mean? So, first of all, we think about what it means broadly for the Department of Labor. You know, when you have, you know, Department of Labor staff who are getting, you know, increases to their, to their salaries, which are meager, you know, that's certainly a good thing when you think about recruitment and retention. Um, you know, and, and of course, you know, the Department of Labor staff right now, it, it's, it's not at the capacity needed to be able to handle, you know, the, the public service needs right now. So if we encounter, you know, an economic slowdown in the future, they're not going to be enough if they, you know, we don't have enough right now if we don't see a growth 
um, in, in staff numbers. And that means the most when you think about black workers in the state because you know, you know, data shows year after year that you know, at any given time, uh, you know, black workers represent about 60% of the unemployment insurance roll. So you know, when we have issues when it comes to serving folks, when it comes to their claims, when it comes to addressing customer service needs, black workers you know, are gonna feel that the heaviest. Um, so I'll go, I'll go to the next slide. Um, and think about like what this means when it comes to modern, modernizing our UI system. So if any of you have heard recently, you know, the Department of Labor is in the process of modernizing its unemployment insurance system. A, no, a, a number of the numbers I just gave when you think about improving customer service and backlog issues are, are about that. But there's a difference between what the governor is asking for and what the, what the Labor Commissioner is asking for. He's asking, the Labor Commissioner is asking for about $10 million more million than the governor right now. And when we think about all these numbers I just laid out, um, you know, it's, you know, the governor, you know, the governor's proposal seems to want to just shift money, shift existing funds to go into modernization efforts, while the labor commissioner wants to add, you know, you know, additional spending to be able to do that while framing a need for modernization around, you know, um, you know, characterizing Georgia ha is having a lot of issues when it comes to fraud and, issue, and, and issues that the Department of Labor has when it comes to meeting audit review. So I'll go to the next slide. Um, and go right into the Department of Corrections. It's just, just to go right through, you know, the Department of Corrections is certainly adding quite a bit more money, um, you know, in, in a minute fiscal year 20, 20, 20, 2024. Uh, about $86 million, a number of those things are going to go to staff and infrastructure. But we just think about how that can better serve those, you know, Georgians who are incarcerated. You know, there's like $65 million that's going to, you know, health and pharmacy services contracts, and 172000 is going to, um, uh, uh, vocational education contracts with the technical college system. Um, and then just going right into the next slide, going into you know, fiscal year 2025, um, there's a $152 million increase in spending for fiscal year 2025 that the governor proposes. You know, we know so much of that is going to go to staff and infrastructure, but when you think about how that can better serve incarcerated Georgians in fiscal year 2025, again, you know, there, there's going to be about $71 million that goes into um, you know, health and pharmacy service contracts, about one million or so is going to go to additional meals on weekends, and then the last thing is that another 172 thousand that goes to um, you know vocational education contracts that are that are with the technical college system. So going to my last slide, and just what we think about you know, what this means, you know, for Georgians, you know, who are you know served in one way or another by, by our state prison system, you know, it, it's a good thing, you know, to see, you know, there's there's extra, you know. Um, investment when you think about health care in the prison system and you think about workforce training. But even with, with all of that, we're still sitting on you know, fiscal policy within the Georgia Department of Correction that, that, that deals with so much inhumane treatment. You know, we talk about um, uh, uh, the commodification of prison communications, whether that's on phone fees, whether that's um, you know, mail fees, and the Department of Corrections made just last year, or in fiscal year 2023, $10 million in revenue behind that. And you think about you know, unpaid incarcerated labor. That still takes place where people who, who were forced to work in prison systems get paid nothing at all. So you know, there's quite a bit of things that are still taking place. And then I also, just, just the, the, the compensated price increases that you know, continue to take place and inflation just compounds on that. So, you know, this ongoing rise in mass incarceration spending is certainly something that is not helpful in our state. You know, there's some things that could be good when you think about health spending or a little bit of workforce training spending, but other than that, um, it's not something to look forward to in the way, in the way that we, you know, continue and, and push more prosperity in the state. So I'll stop there and I'll pass it back to Aaron. Thanks so much, Ray. Um, now we'll be moving to the agencies which fall under GBPI's health justice portfolio, and that includes the Georgia Department of Community Health, the Department of Public Health, and the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities. So I will throw it over to our Director of Health Justice, Leah Chan. Thanks so much, Erin. So um, I, along with our amazing health policy fellow, Hilary Dong, um, lead our health work. Um, next slide. So um, next slide. The departments of behavioral health, uh, community health, uh, excuse me, departments of behavioral health and developmental disabilities, community health and public health are the primary agencies focused on our state's healthcare and public health systems. So the governor proposes allocating more than seven billion um, in state funds for three, these three agencies in fiscal year 2025, which is about a 10% increase over the prior fiscal year. As you can see, uh, the amount allocated for each agency is starkly different. So let's assume we have $10 as a state to spend on health. 
Seven of those dollars are going to Department of Community Health. Two of those dollars are going to Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities. And less than one of those dollars is going to Department of Public Health. Next slide. So I am about to throw a lot of numbers y'all's way. So I wanted to start with a brief look across um, all three health agency budgets. So let's start with what's working. So high turnover and an inability to fill vacancies has been a, an issue that's plagued all three agencies. And there are increases for one-time bonuses, cost of living adjustments, and some salary enhancements. There have also been issues finding community-based providers to serve Georgians with lower incomes due to low reimbursement rates. And there are some important provider rate increases in the budget as well. Another bright spot are the investments made to increase the number of Georgians with intellectual and developmental disabilities who can receive home and community-based services. And lastly, there's a new investment in additional positions at the Department of Community Health to provide oversight of our care management organizations, which provide benefits and healthcare services to much of our Medicaid population. So now let's talk about what's missing. Um, so while there has been momentum in the past several years to address uh, maternal mortality, this budget largely fails to meet the scale of the problem um, where we're seeing far too many women dying um, before, during, and after pregnancy, largely um, deaths that are preventable. In addition, we know that over the course of the Medicaid unwinding, many eligible children are losing access to healthcare coverage, and this budget fails to invest in any sort of intentional effort to ensure that those children regain their coverage. So lastly, what's, what's, um, what's not working? Um, so there's a small but significant de decrease for mental health, which is disappointing given that Georgia still ranks near the bottom in access to mental health services. In addition, our state continues to proceed with the Pathways to Coverage program, Georgia's new health care program for adults with lower incomes that has already cost the state millions, but so far has only enrolled about 2,300 Georgians. And lastly, um, as uh, Dr. Dawes talked a lot about, it's critical that we create the conditions where all Georgians have a fair and just opportunity at good health. But our budget largely invests our state dollars downstream. So we are catching people when they are already very sick or in crisis, and there's very little investment in prevention and keeping people well. So going forward, we really have an opportunity with our state health agency budgets to build more people-powered budgets that advance health equity and racial justice. Next slide. All right, so let's dig into the numbers. So Department of Public Health um, operates programs focused on uh, disease and injury prevention, health promotion, and um, health-related disaster response. So the governor's proposal adds 22 million to that budget. Um, and most of that is accounted for by those uh, cost of living adjustments. I do also want to note the bump for the rural health, uh, or excuse me, the rural maternal health pilot, which will allow the pilot to expand to 13 additional counties. Next slide. So since the Department of Public Health became a freestanding agency in 2012, um, state public health per person has remained largely stagnant However, starting in um, fiscal year 2023, um, you do see a little bit of a bump there, driven largely by cost of living adjustments um, and some salary increases that we've seen consistently in the past few budget cycles. When you look at total public health funding, so both federal and state sources, um, you see that public health funding per person has actually been decreasing over time, again with a slight bump in uh, recent budget cycles. Next slide. All right, so Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities runs our state hospitals and provides community-based services to Georgians living with um, mental health conditions, substance use disorder, and um, developmental disabilities. So the governor is proposing um, a $140 million increase. One of the largest buckets of funding would help increase the number of Georgians with intellectual and developmental disabilities who are able to receive home and community-based services in part by annualizing and adding more waiver slots and also by implementing a much needed um, increase to the reimbursement rate for the providers that um, uh, provide those services and supports. Next slide. 
So we also see reimbursement rate increases for community-based rehabilitation providers who serve Georgians living with um, addiction and other behavioral health conditions, and additional funds for behavioral health crisis centers. Unfortunately, there's also that $11 million decrease that I mentioned for core mental health services. Due to our workforce shortage at the Community Service Board, there's been decreased utilization of mental health services and that uh, reduction largely reflects this. Next slide. So Department of Community Health administers our state's Medicaid and Peach Care program, which provides health care coverage to folks with lower incomes. So the, the governor is proposing about a $485 million increase. And again, in this budget, you see an increase in funds for provider rates, and you also see those additional positions to monitor, evaluate, and improve oversight of care management organizations. Next slide. So Medicaid and Peach Care account for the lion's share of the Department of Community Health's budget. And the governor proposes to spend um, about $5 billion um, in fiscal year 2025. So as you can see in the graph to the right there, more than half of that funding goes to cover older adults and individuals with disabilities, even though they actually represent a minority of who's covered under our Medicaid and Peach Care programs. So the state is actually projecting increased utilization among older adults, individuals with disabilities, and children whose parents earn above the Medicaid threshold, which is our um, age, blind, and disabled, and peach care um, enrollees. The state is also projecting a decreased med Medicaid utilization for our low-income Medicaid program, which covers pregnant women, uh, parents and caregivers with very low incomes, but mostly it covers children. And this decrease in projected utilization is in large part due to the Medicaid unwinding, which I will talk about more on the next slide. All right, so one seismic shift in our healthcare landscape, which impacts people's ability to access care and impacts our state's bottom line is the Medicaid unwinding. So thanks to a pandemic era policy, millions of Georgians have had uninterrupted access to affordable healthcare over the past three years. Starting in April 2023, however, that continuous Medicaid eligibility began to unwind and every child and adult enrolled in Georgia's healthcare safety net will have their eligibility redetermined before the end of May of 2024. So this unwinding is unprecedented, and it's been um, really complex and pretty messy for every state. However, as Ife already pointed out, because of our long-term disinvestment in our state's public benefits enrollment infrastructure, Georgia's unwinding has resulted in preventable harm to Georgia's families and unmanageable burden for our frontline caseworkers. So about half a million Georgians have lost coverage um, since the unwinding began, and most of them have lost coverage for procedural reasons, which means they are likely still eligible and have just gotten caught up in bureaucratic red tape. So inequitable access to economic opportunity for Georgians of color means that low-income Black and Latinx Georgians are less likely than their white counterparts to have access to employer-sponsored coverage, and their families are overrepresented in Georgia's Medicaid and Peach Care system. So as a result, families of color, particularly Black and Latinx children, are likely to see disproportionate losses in coverage due to these procedural denials, again, even though they are likely still eligible. So the pandemic-era continuous um, eligibility policy brought fiscal relief to our state, and the federal, additional federal funds um, more than offset the state, uh, the state cost of Medicaid coverage for the Georgians that they got added to the rolls during the pandemic. The federal government started stair-stepping down that enhanced match in April, and we, we went back to our standard match this month. So that switch back to our standard match, as well as that shift in utilization, is really reflected in our budget. Next slide. All right, so lastly, I would like to talk about um, the governor's signature healthcare waiver programs. Um, in 2019, the passage of the Patients First Act paved the way for Georgia to roll out um, three new programs. The first, the Pathways to Coverage program, which expands Medicaid eligibility to um, low-income adults who meet work or, or other monthly reporting requirements. The Georgia Reinsurance Program, 
which establishes a claims-based um, insur reinsurance program to help op offset costs of enrollees in the individual health insurance marketplace who have large medical claims, and the Georgia Access Model, which um, moves Georgia towards a state-based health insurance marketplace. So overall, the state has made significant investments in these programs, and the, uh, the governor proposes um, making continued investments in both amended fiscal year 2024 and fiscal year 2025. So the largest chunk of funds is for that reinsurance program, though um, those funds are largely offset by federal pass-through funding. Notably, the state plans to invest $16 million in amended fiscal year 2024, um, for an education and outreach to drive people to the state-based marketplace, Georgia Access. Next slide. So I just wanna end with saying what everyone in this room already knows, and that is that full Medicaid expansion is a better deal for Georgia. So Pathways to Coverage has turned out to be a costly, ineffective alternative, and we encourage you to visit georgiapathways.org for more information, thanks. Thanks so much, Leah. So now we will move to our final portfolio, which is education, and we have some cross-team work here. So first we'll start with proposals related to the Department of Early Care and Learning, also known as DECAL, which will be covered by Ife Finch Floyd. Then we'll move to the Department of Education, covered by Dr. Stephen Owens. And then finally to higher education, covered by Ashley Young, which will include the University System of Georgia, the Technical College System of Georgia, the Georgia Student Finance Commission, and the Lottery Fund. So uh, we'll just jump in with Ife. Oh gosh, okay, a lot, <laughs> a lot coming up here. Um, so the Department of Early Care and Learning, or DECAL, operates our child care services, or, um, or CAPS program, child care and parent services, um, the pre-K program, nutrition services and quality initiatives. Um, next slide, please. So the governor's uh, proposed fiscal year 2025 budget would send um, $557 million to DECAL. Most of that um, certainly is um, under the lottery funded Georgia pre-K program. Um, but this is uh, about uh, 117 million or 26% increase um, from the, uh, oh goodness, okay, hold on. I'm reading my notes right, <laughs> wrong. Um, from the budget um, before the pandemic, again, the FY 2020 budget, um, but it is about a $51 million increase or a 10% um, increase from the FY uh, 2024 budget. Um, looking at pre-K specifically, it's about a 10% increase and looking at childcare specifically, it's about an 8% increase. Next slide. So going into just some of the highlights for the amended fiscal year budget um, proposed by the governor, um, again, one of the big ones is the $8.8 .8 million for the bonuses that go for, to state employees, but also um, goes to Georgia pre-K lead and assistant teachers. Um, also, $6.1 million to continue the expansion of, of the successful summer transition program, and that is for... Um, um, rising pre-K students and also rising kindergarten students um, if they are um, trying to make sure they are meeting uh, certain literacy and other educational standards. Next slide. And a few highlights um, for the FY 2025 budget. Uh, about a 278,000 um, for the 4% COLA. Um, 4.6 million to raise the CAPS reimbursement rates to providers to the 50th percentile of market rates. And this is really, really important. So currently, the state reimburse um, CAPS providers um, below the 50% um, percentile of market rates. And that's failing to meet federal standards. Um, what we've seen historically, it's more around like the 25th percentile. Um, so this would put Georgia in line with federal standards. But we have to acknowledge even this is insufficient for childcare providers um, to really cover all their costs, in particular um, their costs um, for, for their teachers. But this is an important step. 
There's also $23.6 million to um, increase the base salaries for lead, pre-K lead and assistant teachers. Um, this is, again, really important, and I will focus um, particularly on the assistant teachers um, who have very low pay. Currently, their pay is about $20,000. Um, so again, $2,500 can be really meaningful for assistant pre-K teachers. Um, another important um, investment, proposed investment, $11 million for the first year of a four-year phase-in to reduce classroom sizes. Um, this is a really important step to improve quality in our pre-K system. It would allow for the teachers in the classrooms to have more one-on-one -on -one engagement with students. Um, and uh, what we heard from Commissioner Jacobs a couple of days ago is that the state plans to, ha to add over 400 classrooms over the next four years. So they're gonna start with expanding with 96 classrooms um, um, this coming year under this budget. Um, and then again, another six million to the continue the expansion of the summer transition program. Next slide. So these are, these are in nominal dollars, just want you to keep that in mind. But under the governor's budget, the pr Georgia pre-K program would have increased by about 56% since FY 2015. Um, so in the 2010s, we saw kind of, you know, um, modest increases. Um, and in more recent years, that ha there have been um, more substantial investments, and that has been led by um, increases uh, to teacher pay. Um, so this is uh, really, really welcome to see um, the governor making these investments. And it, it actually is a part of um, some broader movement that we see in the legislature, particularly in the House, and Danny mentioned this earlier, um, a speaker pro tem led a working group for early childhood education um, last uh, fall, and they came out with recommendations that are um, really, really impressive and are actually proposing $100 million. That's more than 50% um, more than what um, the governor proposed um, to improve pre-K. It includes some of the same recommendations. So of course, increasing pay for lead and assistant teachers and reducing class sizes. Um, but it also includes some additional recommendations like more costs for pu pupil transportation and also helping uh, the public schools with construction costs um, to, to expand classrooms, but also supporting private providers that have a Georgia pre-K program, providing assistance um, to, uh, with mortgages and leases because some of these programs operate out of homes um, or operate out of facilities. And um, while I can't necessarily the state might not necessarily be able to help with construction costs. Helping with these mortgage and lease payments will support these private providers. Um, so it will be very exciting to see um, legislation come out, um, and we are very supportive of, of um, um, how uh, m seeing that that legislation move forward. Next slide. Um, this is a really important contrast. We saw kind of some of the significant growth in the Georgia pre-K program, and it's um, we don't necessarily see that with childcare for infants and toddlers. So under the governor's uh, FY 2025 budget, funding for childcare would have only increased by about 21% um, since 2015. Um, so it's been relatively flat in the 2010s with, a, um, with about a $5 million boost in 2018, and then a drop um, during that first uh, pandemic budget um, in FY 2021, and has slowly <laughs> tried to regain that ground. Um, so the governor's proposal for about $5 million for the CAPS program really is um, important. But it's imp uh, we want to really emphasize, right, if we're talking about bolstering early childhood education, it doesn't start when a child is four. It actually starts when a child is an infant. Um, uh, those who are specialized in early childhood development can note this better than me, but those neurons develop, um, you know, 
on day one and um, they grow very fast with um, a lot of intentional um, adult time from not just from parents but from trained teachers as well. Um, so it's really critical that we have a balanced approach to funding our ECE system, not just our pre-K system but also our child care system as well. Um, also, the federal relief funds are beginning to slowly unwind. Those federal relief funds helped um, protect the uh, uh, ECE, um, in particular the child care system, from uh, spiraling downward and losing a lot of um, um, really uh, great teachers. Um, but we saw last September that the stabilization grants that providers use to boost pay and invest in their programs, those ended last September. Um, and we are already seeing some providers beginning to close uh, classrooms. The Century Foundation has predicted um, about 900 um, providers uh, could close, and that could mean the loss of um, a child care placement for tens of thousands of, of children in Georgia. Additionally, um, the next tranche of federal relief funds is ending in September, and those funds help to boost uh, CAP subsidies, those CAP scholarships. Um, so traditionally, uh, we see CAP subsidies serve about 50,000 um, kids. Um, but with those federal relief funds, we were able to boost that to about 70,000 kids. And we heard Commissioner Jacobs say that they are already um, reducing um, those numbers um, through attrition um, and may have to make some more cuts when those uh, relief dollars um, go away. So the child care system is in desperate need of more state investment. Danny already mentioned um, the using surplus dollars to create a child care trust fund. That would be a huge down payment on a generational shift in our child care system. And of course, this is not just about early childhood development. It's also about our workforce um, and our state economy as well. So I'll pass it on to Stephen. Thanks, Ife. Uh, absolutely. When General Sherman was doing his march through the state of Georgia to successfully end the traitorous attempt to split the United States over whether people could be owned, he freed formerly enslaved folks who would follow behind the troops that gained the attention of the entire nation, um, especially, at least in the state of Georgia, one reverend of the African Methodist Church, Tunis Campbell, uh, born freed black man in New Jersey, who moved to Georgia under the conviction of supporting these people so that we could build schools on Saplo, St. Catherine's Island, uh, have strong worker protections in the service to dignity and work. He was later then uh, a member of the state senate, became a constitutional delegate in the state of Georgia during Reconstruction. A requirement of returning to the Union was that all states included a provision for universal public education. And he is the person most responsible for the fact that we have public education in the state of Georgia. At the time, the provision said a thorough public education during the Civil Rights Movement. Georgia legislators lowered that, or changed it rather, to adequate. I bring up his story not only to give the Reverend Tunis Campbell his flowers, which he much deserves, but also as a recognition of why public education is one of the largest line items, is the largest line item in the state budget. That is true nationwide, because this is not a power at the federal government, but a power at the state level. Now you're gonna see in two slides, what that line item looks like changes in the governor's budget. And I wanna talk about a few of these and just give you an overall picture of what this could look like if this budget is passed in the General Assembly. First, $368 million to continue Governor Kemp's um, regular campaign to increase teacher pay. This would represent a $2,500 raise for teachers as has been the case for several years now, 
This wouldn't take place until, uh, it wouldn't be effective until September 1st, but the fiscal year, as y'all know, starts July 1st. So the amount sent down to schools is not a $2,500 raise. It's actually a $2,083.83 repeating raise that if schools want to give that raise to all teachers, have to find the amount in local funds. But it doesn't stop there. The funding for schools is a three-legged stool with state, local, and federal dollars. The state pays about half of all the teachers in the state of Georgia. So to make up that difference, if a district wants to make sure to increase pay by $2,500 for all teachers, that will mean taking from a limited pot of local tax dollars, which we know looks very different in the Clayton counties of this world, where I went to elementary school, and their, their neighbors in Fayette County, where I went to middle and high school, based on how much property wealth there is per child. We have $250 million line item for enrollment growth and uh, teaching and experience. Um, this is formula growth based on the programs that students are a part of, um, how many credentials and years experience our teachers have. A $242 million increase for, to recognize the employer contribution to the state health benefit program. Uh, one thing that Danny mentioned, $205 million formula increase for pupil transportation, and this billion plus dollars of additional uh, funds that are going to schools are proposed, partially offset by $185 million in local fair share. Now what that is, is a recognition of property values at the local school district. Um, so whenever we see uh, a lowering of this amount, it means that property values have increased on average statewide. But on the next slide, I want to zoom in on that $205 million local for the for formula increase for pupil transportation. Um, it also includes a $5 million, 4.1% pay increase for bus drivers. Um, if you're making $15 an hour, which many bus drivers do, that'll be a 62 cent raise if that's pushed directly down to the drivers, and $20 million to bond out for new buses. Um, all of these increases bring the state funding for people transportation to about $378 million a year. This is a significant jump in the state contribution to this legally required program inside the school. But I wanna, I wanna, I wanna temper a little bit um, what this will mean for districts, because this $205 million will do, go a long way in providing relief for districts. Uh, but that takes us from about 17% to 30%, and that's only if costs remain the same. You can see from this graph that the cost of student transportation has gone up about $400 million every four years. So those costs in 2025, when all is said and done, are going to be much higher than the, that $1.2 billion that we're currently spending to transport students to and from the school. Again, this is still a huge jump and a big relief for school districts um, that will go a long way in supporting this mandatory program. And it comes at a time that you'll see in the next slide that district budgets are being squeezed by the increase in health insurance costs. So in 2022, the amount that schools had to pay per member per month was $945 for health insurance. That increased to $1580 last year, is proposed to increase to $1760 this year. Now this is a cost borne by the state for certified employees. I think your teachers, school counselors, school leaders. But we know that there's as many non-certified employees in the state, in the school, as there are certified employees. Think custodial workers, maintenance workers, bus drivers, right? In the wake of the Great Recession, the Georgia legislature pushed that cost from the state to the individual districts. So when these costs increase, and there's language in the budget that it won't increase, that this last $180 per member per month uh, won't align until 2027, which is a We'll say unique way of budgeting for health insurance. Um, we already know that districts are bearing a lot of this cost right now. And in a survey we sent out, um, which uh, went to every single school district in the state, we found that 44% of respondents, when asked, how will you bear this additional cost, this cost to pay for your pair pros, for your lunch workers, for your bus drivers, 
it, without state investment, what will the school do? 44% said that it would result in a reduction in force. So that is privatizing maybe your custodial work, that is not hiring new positions or layoffs. Um, there will be real consequences if we ignore these squeezes that happen at those local districts. Let's go to the next slide, please. Now, this is a little bit wonky, but I want to talk because these costs are not borne evenly across the state because of the uniquely American way that we fund school districts with a strong reliance on local property taxes. Now, state has a provision called the Equalization Grant which attempts to, as you can imagine, equalize between di districts. So you have some of the richest districts in the state per child, think Burke County, they've got about 2,000 kids in a nuclear power plant. Um, some of the least wealthy per child, think rural Southwest Georgia, Jeff Davis County, name after a trader, Quitman County, Cook County. Um, these do not have as much wealth per property, per child, but the, the state has this grant, which equalizes to the state average. So that average district, if you rank every single district, um, those that fall in the bottom 50% receive this equalization grant to, to pretend as if they have the tax base of the state average. Um, since 2014, you can see that when the new formula, it used to equalize to the 75th percentile, now was lowered to the 50th percentile. You can see that growth has been incremental, has even dipped in past years. Um, this is a quarter of a billion dollar jump for the equalization program. The headline of this, I know I have a headline, but the headline we take home from this is that the gap between our richest and our poorest districts is growing at an incredible rate that we have not seen, at least in the 30, 40 years that we've had our current funding formula for schools. Our richer school districts are far outpacing how much they can raise in local property taxes than the state average, and we are, uh, we're seeing that in real time, and that's going to have a real effect on the program inside the school. Now, equalization, its goal is to just provide a, a base level. This uh, is an attempt to just have a fairer way so that District A and District B have the same dollar amount no matter how much the houses are worth. But if you zoom in on the school, there is still real disparities between how much is provided to each child so that they have the needs, they, or they have the resources they need to achieve what they can. So on this next slide, we're gonna talk about, we're gonna move away from equality to equity, to fairness. What does it look like to give every child what they need to succeed? And Georgia remains one of only six states in the United States that does no additional funding to educate students living in poverty. The number one challenge we know of in the schoolhouse, which is the difference in how much people's parents make and the results then in student outcomes. We have no additional funding to equalize that amount inside the school so that students have what they need. Um, this remains a glaring weakness in the way that we fund schools and is one of the reasons that Georgia has one of the highest what people might call achievement gaps in the nation. I'm not going to call it a gap because gaps are there whether you like it or not. Um, this is a penalty to our students living in poverty because there is no connection between intelligence and how much money your parents make. So if the test scores bear out a difference which they do, that is the difference in state services provided, in the resources provided to tap into ch children's potential, which makes the recent push by um, the General Assembly and by the governor in the state of the state for discriminatory private school vouchers that much more dangerous. But I want to show you that on the next slide. The current push for public funds for private education expenses uh, initiatives that GBPI has a long-standing opposition against um, would focus on those bottom 25% of schools as ranked by the, the, the way that we rank schools in Georgia, the College and Career Readiness Performance Index. That tracks so closely to how much kids' parents make 
that it used to be an A through F grade. The schools that got an A, only 10% of their students lived in poverty. Schools that got an F, over 56% of the students in poverty. So we're punishing these schools that are serving students that have more low income students and then saying, what if we could divert those tax dollars instead to private schools that can choose to and regularly do not educate a child because um, they do, their gender does not align with their sex at birth, because they have gay parents, uh, because they have dyslexia or another disability. This is a regular occurrence inside private education because we're not giving them the people's money. The current push, we, so I wanted, to, I wanted to show not only the discriminatory nature of private schools, of which I used to teach in for several years, but also how this is not evenly serving children in Georgia. So what I tried to do is controlling for population, showing how much one of our two current private schools are actually really being filtered in just to the state's cities. Fulton and DeKalb County have 20% of the state's population using well over 30% of all the private school voucher dollars. This is a policy that is taking from rural Georgia and paying to the only places where private schools exist. Um, and for that, one of many reasons we'll continue to oppose a policy like this. But there is good news, however. The good news is the people of, of Georgia understand this. Uh, we got a great poll out of the AJC yesterday that showed almost two thirds of all Georgians when polled, uh, do they support or oppose private school vouchers like Senate Bill 233, um, which got close to but ultimately failed last year. 62% of those Georgians oppose this policy. They recognize that there is a consequence to diverting necessary resources from our public schools to our private schools, but I'm gonna end on this. It can't just be defending against private school vouchers. We can't just maintain the status quo. That is for reasons organizations like GVPI, like the organizations we part with, partner with in Fund Georgia's Future, we are pushing for a just education system because maintaining ableist, white supremacist policies inside the school can't be the goal. We have to constantly be pushing our public schools to do right by all kids. Um, and someone I know who's continuing in that fight in the higher education space is who I'm gonna push it to next, my colleague, Ashley Young. Thank you, Stephen. I didn't know if I want to take off running or what. That was that fired me up. We got a history lesson and um, all things hired. Uh, excuse me, K twelve and in Georgia, we love to see it. Um, my name is Ashley Young, and I am an education policy analyst here at GBPI, and I focus specifically on higher education. Um, as our Southern preachers like to say, I will not be before you long. I'm just going to uh, wrap us up here, um, but I'm going to begin with a quote by one of my favorite um, intellectuals, Dr. Bettina Love. She says that abolitionist educators advocate for children that they will never meet or see because we are visionaries. And that's what I hope um, this portion of the presentation um, will do. So next slide, please. So we're going to kick it off with uh, Board of Regents. So for looking at our public four-year colleges, um, this is pretty straightforward here. Uh, the funding for USG colleges and universities increased by $195 million this year, 4% for a cost of living adjustment for full-time um, benefit eligible employees, and that totaled $92 million. $22 million increase for employer share of health benefits, and $66 million million dollars to restore the FY 2024 formula funds. I'm going to come back to that in just a moment, delve a little bit deeper. And then 823000 for Fort Valley State University land grant match requirements. Um, and that's for the teaching program. That's up from $540,000. So let me spend a little time talking a little bit um, of why it is critical for the $66 million restoration. So um, about three years ago in 2021, can you believe it's been three years since 2021? Uh, right. So three years ago, um, uh, the USG uh, took a 10% hit because of COVID. 
right? So the USG was still reeling from that when we then fast forward to 2024, saw the $66 million cut. This is a huge issue. We don't want to normalize these cuts as we continue to get in the hole with higher education. What I really want to touch on here is that we have been underfunding higher education for over 20 years. Um, uh, Chancellor Perdue will tell you this. Tracy Cook, um, who's the chief fiscal fiscal officer um, with, uh, the Board of Regen uh, with the Board of Regents will also tell you this as well. This is no secret. So Georgia should be funding higher education at a 75% for the state share and 25% from tuition and um, monies from families and students. What we, where we are now is currently at 57% for the state share and 43%. So that is about a quarter up from what students and families were paying or responsible for at 25% in 2001. And now in 2000, um, excuse me, 2024, uh, students and parents through tuition and other um, forms of aid are providing 43% of that, um, of that form formula. And so this is a major issue um, that we want to continue to uh, bring to the surface and also really emphasize why restoring this $66 million is really, really critical to higher education in Georgia. Um, I want to take a moment, just by a show of hands, did anybody hear uh, Fort Valley State University as a second Morrell Act, okay, good, um, being underfunded? Did anybody hear that last fall? Okay, some heads are shaking good. Well, either way, you're gonna get this new information. Um, and it's not necessarily good news, of course. So um, Governor Kemp received a letter from the Secretary of Agriculture and the US Secretary of Education last fall stating that uh, the state of Georgia has been underfunding its HBCU 1892nd uh, Morrell at uh, Act land grant institution at a whopping $603 million over the last 30 years. Um, just a little side note here, when I did research for our college completion grants, which is a step in the right direction to help students get over the finish line, some of the HBCUs that we talked to, we found that they were lacking software and the infrastructure to actually implement the grant. These are the types of stories on the ground that we are hearing from colleges, and this is just one program, right? Where they are not able to do their job, why? Because of this headline that Fort Valley State University University for reasons like this are being underfunded. So there is a required match. And again, that's up from last year, which is helpful. But again, we're talking $603 million over the course of 30 years. So I just want to highlight those very two important points here um, in an analysis because they are important in this conversation. Lastly, I just want to po point out that the total state general funds allotted for Board of Regents of, um, with the University System of Georgia equals $3 billion. And in this next slide, I'm, I'm going to sort of talk about why budget equity matters. So as you can imagine, having a post-secondary credential um, or degree credential, it matters, right? Um, when we think about what students need to go to school and as we think about um, the fact that we are underfunding um, higher education, we know that students will need money to go to college. College affordability, um, the this crisis is becoming increasingly um, important. And so, um, uh, back one slide, please. Thanks so much. So I just want to point out here, um, students of color are less likely than white students to receive the HOPE scholarship. So how does this connect to what I just spoke about, right? So as we're talking about underfunding higher education, somebody, something has to fill that gap, right? And so we know that HOPE scholarship is um, has, has had a lot of commercial success, but it has also caused a lot of racial disparities in our state. So what you see here in uh, the University System of, of Georgia, over 100,000 students are white, and of those 100,000 students, 60%, so over half of the students that are white receive HOPE scholarship. 
Um, as you can see with Asian students, 67% um, of those students receive the HOPE scholarship. But what about our racially marginalized, um, other racially marginalized students, excuse me, Hispanic students and black students? So I want to point out only 50% of Hispanic students are receiving HOPE scholarship. So as you can imagine, this makes college affordability very, very difficult. And then for black students, um, only 33% of black students are receiving the HOPE scholarship. This is why budget equity matters in the University System of Georgia. If students are responsible for 43% and students are not getting the HOPE scholarship, how are they going to fill that gap? I can tell you a little bit more about that in just a moment when I talk about need-based aid, but we're gonna keep going to the next slide and talk a little bit about um, TCSG or the Technical College System of Georgia. So um, we've seen some increases with technical education. As you can see, a budget increase of $22 million, $11 million for the 4% cost of living, um, and then also $9 million for the increase in enrollment. Adult education, also seeing some increases there, so that's very good news. A $5 million um, increase for adult education and $218,000 for the 4% cost of living. Before I get to my last point there, I want to point out that um, Commissioner Dozier just spoke this week in his presentation that enrollment is going up and they are starting to see with technical college system almost like pre-pandemic enrollment. So that's really, really great. Um, um, there's about 136,000 students enrolled right now. He's projecting 144,000. And so having these budget increases are going to be helpful. But unfortunately, much like the University System of Georgia, um, the, the actual budget operates off the prior years. And so it's a little bit difficult to kind of keep up with enrollment and maintenance and other operations and such, which that's what our formula is based on. Um, so when you have these increases, you gotta kind of do some catching up. Um, the last point I wanna make clear here, the $5 million for the Workforce Accelerator Pilot Program. Um, this was just established last session and this was a bipartisan um, effort to ensure or to qualify, rather, private colleges to be able to provide instruction um, and courses for adult learners who are going back to get their high school diploma. Next slide, please. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Georgia Student Finance Commission. This is rather straightforward. I'm gonna really um, let you know which program saw no change. So that's the tuition equalization grants that remains at 23 million. College completion grants um, remains at 10 million um, in the proposed budget. A noteworthy budget change that didn't see an increase last year, dual enrollment is seeing an increase of 15 million for a total of 91 million. And then HOPE scholarships, unlike last year we saw lot of increases um, with the restoring hope to the previous year of 100% uh, factor rate. But unfortunately, this year we're seeing for our USG schools a $9 million increase, in private schools a $16 million decrease, and HOPE grant at TCSG a $21 million decrease. Next slide, please. Okay, so I want to spend um, a, a few moments on this slide, and I want to start off with a couple of anecdotes, so just bear with me here. Um, I was a um, college counselor in Atlanta Public Schools for seven years, and unfortunately, the worst part of my job was in the spring when I would hear from students that they um, could not afford college, college affordability. This is a major issue. Um, I then remember, fast forward to our last in-person GBPI conference, um, I was there as a guest, and I remember my predecessor, Jennifer Lee, when she mentioned that there was over a billion dollars in the education lottery. Now, I just have to pull this up on my phone because I took a picture of the slide and I favorited it. And on January 20, uh, 24th, 2020, the lottery reserves total was at 1.3 billion. Just the lottery total in education lottery, right? Now we are at 2.2 billion dollars. Four years, folks, four years. At that point, when I was just a guest of GBPI, there were 706 million in the unrestricted. Now we have around 1.4, 
1.4. So it is growing exponentially. So um, I want to talk a moment about biscuits. What burns my biscuits? Our team hears me say, uh, hears, will hear me say this all the time. What burns my biscuits, y'all, is that we have $1.4 billion in the unrestricted education lottery. And so as a former college counselor, this set me ablaze. I was super disappointed, actually went and applied for a PhD program right here at Georgia State. I'm studying ed policy because this work matters to me. Um, I really want to make it clear that we can use this money, not just for need-based aid, but much like what my colleague um, Ife Finch Floyd talked about for our early learning, for our pre-K. We need to be able to hire teachers and provide the infrastructure that are going to help our students complete this pipeline that Stephen has talked about that I'm speaking about. And so in order to do that, we need to utilize these funds equitably. And I'm going to stop in just a moment with this last slide here. Thank you so much, Hillary. The impact on racially marginalized Georgians, I just want to leave you all with this. This is an issue not just for racially marginalized people, but also for white students. And, and, and we need to be clear that this is, a, this is an issue for all of our students. In this graph, it says black students have has the highest student loan debt at 300 and 73 million, that's major when, when black students only make up about 33% of the USG, right? And then black students are obviously more prone to um, borrowing money. So unfortunately, black students make up about 55% of the student loan debt, um, people who borrow student loans. I'm going to leave you with this last fact here. Um, Georgia is ranked um, number one in the nation for merit-based aid with Hope Scholarship. We are one of two states that does not have need-based aid, and we are third in the nation for student loan debt per borrower. We can do better, and again, as Dr. Bettina Love said, as a visionary, this is the work that we are committed to, and we wanna make sure that all students have an equitable um, higher education experience here in Georgia. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ashley, and to all of our analysts. Um, and we will be remiss if we did not remind you this. You know our name. This is not the last time we'll be talking about the budget. So if you missed something here today or you'd like a presentation on the budget proposal or on our budget primer later in the year, please feel free to reach out to any of the analysts on this stage or send me an email. If you're not sure who to reach out to, my email is erobinson at gbpi.org. We'd be happy to set that up for you. And now I quickly just want to check in with the powers that be and make sure we have time for a few questions because we did get a few from the audience. OK, great. Um, so we'll go ahead and jump in on those. Um, and we haven't heard from Danny in a minute, so I'll start with you. Um, we have a few questions about the surplus, uh, but the first one is, if the law caps are reserves at 15%, how is it legal? How is it possible that our surplus has grown this much in the last few years? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. And, and, and it really just demonstrates the overreach that we've seen and, and how unprecedented the governor's use of, of the powers in that office uh, have gone to distort our budget system. So under state law, the governor has full and complete authority over the revenue estimate. And that's extremely important because once the governor makes a decision on the revenue estimate, it, it cannot be challenged uh, by the General Assembly. That authority is completely within the governor's office. So the governor has set revenue estimates that are far lower than the amount the state is actually collecting. And those estimates cap the amount that the General Assembly can appropriate. So at the end of every year, the, the difference between the money that the state spends and the money that the state raises automatically goes into reserves. So in 2021, we hit that 15% limit that's, that's under state law, and we continued to go further and further and further into undesignated reserves. And the General Assembly, you know, to, to their part in this, has not acted to adjust the law. So we're still operating under this framework that was established in 2011, where state law caps the, the revenue shortfall reserve at 15%. That's the amount the state has determined is needed in the, the event of a recession. Uh, 
but has not acknowledged in anywhere under state law the, the un, undesignated reserves. So the governor has essentially absorbed that authority uh, completely. The state hasn't created any, any new regulations. And, and as a result, we have this kind of black box that's now twice the size of the revenue shortfall reserve that we call unobligated. Uh, and and it, it, it really is a, a very serious issue and, and just demonstrates how far under our capacity we're acting. You know, we've heard from the team how many needs we have, the, 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 you know, what we're, what we're not doing for Georgians. Uh, and, and at the same time, we're allowing ourselves to just continue to build and build uh, in this account, um, you know, to, to seemingly no end. So um, that, that, that's kind of the why. Um, but, but it just makes so clear uh, that we have the resources, that we can do more, and that it's an active choice not to. Thank you so much, Danny. We got a quick one for Stephen right here. Can transportation funding be used both for capital costs like buses and employees like bus drivers? Yes, they have a ton of flexibility on how to use those funds. This is true of a lot of the ways that we fund schools. It can go to bus driver pay. It can go to benefits because I have a, a paltry pension uh, for the non-certified employees. Of, uh, inside the school. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's tons of costs replacing buses. And a lot of times it does because we're not providing enough funds in other areas uh, to meet those necessary costs. So yes, lots of flexibility. Great, thank you so much. And we have one for Leah right here. How does split health agency governance affect the state's ability to be more intentional about devising coherent statewide strategies? Ooh, that's a hard question. That's a good question. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so we did have some like sort of deconsolidation, like as you know, 2012 um, Department of Public Health split off um, on, to be on its own. Um, I would say um, that I don't know if it's so much in the structure of the depart the health agencies as it is in. Um, what kind of budgets and policies come out of those agencies. Because um, that could happen whether they are separate or whether they're together. Um, so, I mean, sorry, I will stop because I know you have other questions. If you want to wrap it up, you can. Okay. <laughs> um, so we got another question for Danny. How much of the state's surplus includes ARPA dollars? And is GBPI tracking ARPA spending dollars? None of that includes ARPA dollars. So, so what I was talking about as well, the $16 billion figure is general fund surplus. So that is broken out between, you know, about $5.4, $5.3 billion in, in the RSR, in the Revenue Shortfall Reserve, the account that's capped at 15%, and then almost $11 billion in the undesignated account that's not even recognized by state law. That's $16 billion. On top of that, we have the lottery reserve. That's another $2.2 billion. Uh, and, and, and then there, there are no federal dollars included in that. We have done some work on, on ARPA. Uh, I, I believe in, in the last budget primer, you'll, you'll find a section that looks at how the states distributed those dollars. Uh, actually, that, that's an area where, because of Georgia law, Governor Kemp was given full authority, 100% of the authority, uh, to distribute those dollars out of his office. Uh, there, there's a, a, a small fraction of that funding that remains uh, undesignated. Uh, OPB actually does a, a decent job of tracking this uh, on their website, kind of disclosing what's been spent versus what's been allocated. Uh, but the state has spent almost all of those funds so far. Um, and the real kind of area where that's fed in is that the federal government's actions with, with ARPA, uh, with, with the other COVID bills, helped us avert what could have been a depression-like recession. Um, and that was really at the heart of preserving state revenues, preserving our recovery, our economy, putting money in Georgians' pockets so that they could keep uh, their livelihoods and, and we didn't see kind of that spillover into a massive economic recession. And so that federal infusion, you know, is undeniably part of how our state has held up so well, how we've continued to generate increasing revenues and have gotten through the pandemic era uh, without... Uh, you know, kind of missing a beat on that front. 
um, but it's not actually reflected in those surplus numbers that we've given you today. Thank you so much, Danny. Um, I just want to remind the audience um, that even if we don't get to your question today, we do have them, and so we will make sure we send out a list of questions that were submitted with the answers if we don't get to your question today. And we're going to have to wrap up here, so I will finish with one question that I'm really excited about that we got from the audience for everyone. Um, ask that you keep your answers short and sweet. Um, well, they don't have to be sweet. I take that back. <laughs> Just keep them short. Um, so we'll start with Ife. What are some top lines about your focus area that you wish everyday working Georgians knew? Short, right? Yeah. Okay. I feel like I'm taking the time to think. Um, so let's focus on human services, right? So human services provides, again, um, those public benefits for um, individuals who are living with low income, experiencing poverty. Um, and I neglect, neglected in my remarks to talk about kind of the racial um, breakout. And we con consistently see year over year that black families, black individuals, um, Latino families tend to have higher levels of poverty um, than white families. But I think what's critical to understand is that because we do not have, right, like we have a very low minimum wage, the state minimum wage is $5.15, is that right, Ray? Um, and um, when we have the low wage labor market that is often um, unstable, is that different people at different times can rely on these, will need to rely on these benefits. And it's not just about having that policy. It's about having a robust customer service um, from the human services to actually access those policies. Because we have, you know, we the SNAP program is one of the largest entitlement programs that we have, but because of its customer service, people are applying and not getting their SNAP benefits on time. And in fact, now there uh, are federal um, uh, uh, concerns coming from the federal government um, that they have a corrective action plan to not meeting um, those timeliness measures. So, you know, these public benefits that human services provides, anyone at any point could need them. But it's not just about having those resources available, it's about providing the infrastructure so that individuals, families, children can actually access those benefits. I'll pass it to Ray. Yes, yes. Um, I, I, <laughs> I know it's hard for analysts to keep yeah. it short, uh, and I know all of this is very important, so yeah. I want to acknowledge that. Uh, yes, yeah, so I mean, that's pretty hard for me as well. So, I mean, I, I, I would say that um, one thing I wish that more people would understand is that you know, any kind of policy issue that we deal with, they all overlap. You know, when you think about education policy and, and how poverty plays such a big deal when you think about outcomes, you know, the way that we, you know, establish and, and continue workforce policy, it, it contributes to poverty. When we think about the, you know, the criminal legal system policies that we continue to perpetuate and push and, and, and have an impulse to go to, that perpetuates poverty. That, and that right there has an impact when you think about educational outcomes, you know, the way that we, you know, stigmatize, you know, helping people when they're in their lowest points, when you think about, um, you know, cash assistance programs, you know, SNAP, so many child care. Um, that, you know, these are the type of things that also is another thing that contributes to poverty. And people, you know, we talk policy up here, but everybody else is experiencing all these things in, in, a, in a certain rhythm of their lives that, you know, where, where it all just connects. So um, understand that when, when, we, when we debate an issue in the legislature that, you know, it's not an issue that should be siloed. You know, when we, when we make decisions about any particular issue, they have impacts and effects everywhere else. And people feel that in every aspect of their lives. Um, sure. So I think one thing um, that I would love for everyone to know that I'm sure many people already know, but is bears repeating over and over, is that we um, have an option available to us that would expand access to affordable health care for almost half a million Georgians, bring billions in federal funds to our state that would um, create tens of thousands of jobs, increase um, state and local tax revenues by hundreds of millions of dollars. It would um, help stabilize uh, the finances for particularly rural hospitals and um, help uh, avoid medical debt for uh, Georgians with lower incomes. 
Um, and instead of that route, instead of bringing those federal dollars to our state, instead of creating jobs, instead of expanding access to health care for hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, hundreds of thousands of Georgians, we have chosen a path that is more costly and less effective. So the Pathways to Coverage program, um, which we, the governor spent um, years fighting in court, um, spent, has already spent millions of dollars on. Um, it launched in July, and um, as of the most recent enrollment estimate, it is covering about 1% of the Georgians who are potentially eligible. And that is um, our state tax dollars that are going to pay for that program because it does not qualify for those additional federal funds that, would, that we'd qualify for under full Medicaid expansion. Um, so as Stephen mentioned, there was an AJC poll, 69% of Georgians support expanding Medicaid. Um, and so what I would say to people is your voice is important. Legislators need to hear from you and they need to hear that you support full Medicaid expansion and that this Pathways to Coverage is not an acceptable alternative. $13.3 billion is a lot of money. That's the amount that goes to K-12 education. The temptation is to look at that dollar amount and think how could they want any more Look at how, money, how much money is being spent on schools. Um, that is like opening up a car's hood and saying, how could it be broken? Look how many parts there are, right? Like it is expensive to educate students to world-class standards. And if you meet someone that says, I know schools have enough, how can we continue to operate where teachers have to take a 27% pay cut to enter into the classroom compared to staying in the private sector? when you control for experience and credentials. Mm -hmm. All right, if, it, if we have too much money, then how can we continue um, to force that terrible choice on our educators? And so there's still a ways to go and we can afford it. Sweet, okay. Um, so for higher education, just two things, because there's always two things. The first thing is that um, we are one of two states that does not have need-based aid. One of two states, um, Hope Scholarship is a merit-based scholarship. Governor Zell Miller was about, um, of the ideology, that you have to give something to get something. That is very much steeped in neoliberal policies that do not serve as well. And so we need to be very mindful that when we hear pushback about college affordability and the response is Hope Scholarship, you meet them with the energy that we have, that we are one of two states that does not have need-based aid and we need need-based aid in Georgia. The last thing is, and I didn't talk about this um, in my presentation portion, but we need to defend DEI in higher education. We need to defend DEI in higher education. That is one of my priorities. We cannot sit here and think that any of the issues that we have discussed today are that we're going to disrupt the status quo if we do not intervene in our higher education system and make sure that we are building critical consciousness. And the only way that we do that is that we talk about our history, we talk about the issues that take place within race relations, and we work towards bringing justice for those things. So we have to defend DEI, and we must um, continue to ring the alarm that we are one of two states that does not have need-based aid. Great. Danny, thank you so much, Ashley. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just, you know, kind of echo the point again uh, that, that many of our policy failures are a choice, and, and that is because of our failure to use the resources available to us on behalf of Georgians. We have the funds available, both in, time, in terms of the surplus and recurring revenues that are turning into more surplus. You know, so, so we have the resources available. I think oftentimes folks assume that, that we're spending all that we have uh, and, and that we don't have enough resources to address these issues, but we do. And, and, and that is a choice uh, of our state leaders, uh, and, and we can do more right now. Thank you so much to our analysts, especially in a time crunch. And now